All right, today I got a treat for y'all. You know how I've always been talking about uh, you need to have a good mortgage person. So today I want to bring y'all on and introduce you to my mortgage person, my go-to guy. This is Matt Schwartz out of Texas, and he's with South Lake uh, Mortgage. And I'm going to let him tell you all about himself. And then we're going to ask some questions about how do you find the right loan officer? All right. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Roger. No, I appreciate you having me on. Um, so I've been in the mortgage business now for a little over 10 years. Uh, I'm an originating branch manager, which means I operate the branch, but I also originate, meaning I do loans. Um, we've obviously done plenty of deals together, so you know how I operate. Um, but we try to make it as easy as possible and we'll go into some details as far as, you know, qualifying goes, how we operate as far as the applications go, doing it personally over the phone versus the online app and why that can be a bad thing. Um, but yeah, uh, licensed personally in, I don't know, 30 some odd states, Tennessee included, of course. Um, so what else do you look, do you suggest that people look for in a loan officer besides just experience? Uh, being hands-on. I, I think that that's the most important thing. I think doing an online application is a red flag. Um, and it's not the client's fault, but there's nuances to calculating income, right? There's certain circumstances where you can't use overtime, where you can't use bonuses, you can't use commission, or if you can use it, it has to be calculated and averaged in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And online applications just aren't comprehensive enough comprehensive enough to capture that information right. uh, the alternative is talking to the client which i mean is the right thing to do anyway but it serves a dual purpose um, so what i do is i get on the phone with the client and i take the application it's very simple it's name date of birth social your address whether you rent or you own there uh, who do you work for how are you paid how much are you paid right and uh, that's it assets how, how much do you have in the bank how much checking savings 401k retirement and then how much are you looking to buy purchase price. Um, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. But where the loan officer and their experience really plays a big role is knowing how to take that information and properly interpret it and put it into the file. Right. So I, I, my head, not laugh, but cringe, you know, when I talk to a client, they're like, yeah, I already talked to a bank. They're working on it. Mm -hmm. What do you mean working on it? Mm -hmm. It's, it's your credit, it's your income and your assets. And literally inside of a five, 10 minute phone call, you can determine accurately, literally with no paperwork, whether or not somebody qualifies. So when somebody's three days in, you know, on, a, on an approval, it's like, well, what's, what's going on? And inevitably it's because, you know, they had them go to an online application. Mm -hmm. uh, then they start requesting documents, you know, truthfully, and you've, you've been around it with your experience. If you have all the necessary information and accurate information, you don't need any documents you just need the accurate info right. you know how much you paid per hour 34 dollars an hour do you work 40 hours a week yes has there ever been a time where you work less than 40 no have you been at the job when when did you start okay you've been there over two years so now we can use your overtime if need be so you know it's just a matter of knowing how to ask the right questions but if you're doing an online application the loan officer never gets the opportunity to ask those questions right. and then you want a wild goose chase to go get paperwork you know, that you're going to inevitably have to resend anyways when you go under contract because the stuff is outdated at that point. Exactly. So I, I don't like wasting anybody's time, um, mine especially. <laughs> so, you know, it's served me well for the last 10 plus years, a five, 10 minute phone call with the client. And, and the benefit there is I get to ask the client the right questions. They get to ask me the questions and we're all properly prepared for the transaction. And that's where you get a smooth deal the whole way through. Exactly. And I can attest to that because I've, I've sent plenty of people to Matt. He will have a conversation with them, which is so lacking in these days. You know, I know everybody's used to COVID and we don't see each other. We don't talk to each other. We don't touch each other and everything. But just having a conversation as opposed to, you know, being a keyboard war warrior, putting that stuff in, Matt has been like, OK, this person they're not ready or this person's not ready just from talking to them and knowing like how they 
file their taxes, how they are paid, when he was talking about the income, how have they been filing their taxes, what's really going on with people, that'll save a whole lot of heartache instead of people going out and you get this little blanket, you know, this vanilla approval online that says, yeah, you're approved. And then when you really get to underwriting and you can't close, then you're you're really upset. And it it, and because it doesn't have to happen like that. And, right. and again, not the customer's fault. You know, they may be making $60,000 a year, right? But if $20,000 of that is commission and you haven't been getting commission for two years, right? right. So you don't need 60,000 in the bank size. And again, a quick conversation, asking the right questions, you can avoid that heartache that you and I all know all too well happens mm -hmm. where, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my approval through quick and look, I'm approved. I'll call you if I need you. And, and uh, you know, not all the time, but you know, a week before they're supposed to close, that's when they're calling back going, hey, you're right. You know, da, da, da. and it, again, it's not the client's fault in their eyes. They make 60 grand a year or whatever in reality. But, you know, when you start talking about averaging income and, and stuff that goes into this, you, you really need somebody who knows what they're doing, f figuring it out with you and, and talking you through it. So yeah, definitely. And one, one thing I want you to speak on is we have so many people who are doing a side hustle, especially since the pandemic jumped off, whether they're doing Uber or Lyft or Shipped or Instacart or whatever. Can you get, give me a brief explanation of how to count that income. I, I think I've covered it before in a couple of videos, but just they want to hear it directly from the horse's mouth. How do you count your side hustle income? Yeah, no, no good question. And, and to preface, I, I'm going to preface with this. These rules that, that I'm, I'm citing are not our bank's rules. Right. The government makes up the rules. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to me or Quicken or Bank of America, right, and you hear two different things, it boils down to who knows what they're talking about because there is no discretion in lending, right? Right. Everything, for the most part, securitized by Fannie Mae, Ginnie Mae, and Freddie Mac. Yeah. That's it. So when a lender tells you one thing and you hear something else from another lender, it boils down to which lender is giving you accurate information. It's right. not that the other has different rules. So uh, I'll tell you honestly, with the side hustle stuff, it's self-employment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. You must have a two-year history supported by two years of filed tax returns. Not only that, it's not how much money you make, but it's how much money you net on the tax returns. Mm -hmm. So after deductions, right? right. So if you made $30,000 driving Uber, cool, but you wrote off $25,000 of it, you got five grand left. They're giving you credit for the $5,000. Exactly. That's what it boils down to. And not only that, but they're averaging the most recent two years. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, you filed a net of 5,000 in 2020 and a net of 10 or 50,000 in 2021. Well, that's 55,000 divided by 24. They're not just giving you credit for the 55,000. So it's the net, you have to have two years of filed tax returns, and it's the average of the last two years net from the taxes. Exactly. And, you know, being an underwriter, like I say, it's black and white for us. It's yeah. very simple. Either the math works or it doesn't, you know. Yeah, there's no discretion to the lending. There, there's none. You can get creative and move around some pieces. But what it boils down to is three things. It's credit, income, and assets. And it's not me. It's not the underwriter making the decision, at least not when it's done properly. It's Fannie Mae's automated underwriting system or you have Freddie Mac LP, right? Mm -hmm. that system, there's an algorithm, it, your credit, your income, and your assets. It's not me or an underwriter looking, going, well, we like this one, we don't like this one. Nobody's, nobody cares, to be honest with you. And you know that as well as I do in this business. We, we don't, I mean, we care about getting the deal done. Don't get me wrong. And we care about treating you right. That, that's the whole basis for this. But nobody's making decisions off of who you are. I mean, that's just, it, there is an automated underwriting system reading the credit, the income and the assets and spitting out a yes or no. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a good loan officer and it's a no, you know, again, maybe you can move the pieces around a little bit and shift it to a yes. That's the benefit of working with somebody with, with some experience who knows how to move around a little bit, but it's credit income and assets. And, and I'll put it to you like this, the higher the credit scores are, mm -hmm. the more you can get away with on the, on the income, the higher the debt to income ratio can be. The better the assets you have, right, or the income you have, the lower the credit scores can be. That's there right. is a relationship between those three things. 
So it's, and it's not a hard, fast number. It boils down to the makeup of your credit report, uh, the credit scores, how much money you have in the bank, whether you have reserves, your debt to income ratio. You know, you, you, you can get a, an approval, an automated approval out of a 580 credit score all day, but you're not getting it at a 48 DTI with, without reserves in the bank. Exactly. You know, whereas on the flip side, you know, if you have a 580 credit score, but you have a 25 DTI, which is a moderately low DTI, and you have $30,000 in reserves and a 401k, that'll approve, right? right? But if you're working with lower credit, you got to have some strength in either the income or the assets to offset that. Right, right. And speak just a, a couple of seconds on the importance of the DTI. I mean, I keep going over, you know, like you got to do your homework, get your DTI together, get your DTI, know what your DTI is, know how your debts are reporting on your credit report. And the importance, like you said, of having assets and a good credit score when it comes to that DTI, because sometimes you can push that DTI can be pushed up a little bit if you have other good compensating factors. Right. So, of course. So, the, again, the debt to income ratio limits are set by the government. They're set by Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, FHA, VA, whatever entity is behind the deal. Uh, and again, these guidelines are uniform. Now, some banks will impose overlays. That's where they make up rules on top of the rules mm -hmm. that make it more to qualify. But if you're working with a lender who truly doesn't have any overlays, well, you're just working with the government rules. So for example, on a conventional loan, you can go up to a 50% debt to income ratio. Uh, that's on a conventional loan. On an FHA loan, you can go up to a 57% debt to income ratio. With VA, you can get away with up to about a 65% DTI, but you have to have good credit scores and you have to be passing the residual income test. That's a, that's a story for a different day. Um, but debt to income you know, is very easily calculated on your own. It's not a mystery calculation. So you have your debt to income, right? So the debts include the proposed mortgage payment, right? And then any minimum monthly payments that appear on your credit report. Right. So credit card, people call me, well, I have $15,000 in credit card debt. I don't care. Right. It's your minimum monthly payment on that account. One more question in this. Um, I know um, here in Tennessee, we're definitely in, well, in Nashville, we're definitely in a seller's market where sellers definitely have the upper hand. We're getting multiple offers on, you know, every listing that comes out and everything. And I know a lot of my first time buyers are getting <laughs> discouraged. Are, are there any tips that you can give them to get ready so that they can make a strong offer when it when they're especially when they're in these multiple offer situations? Yeah, you, you have to have money to buy a house. <laughs> say, but, it again, what, say it again for the people in the back who didn't hear it. Yes. Yeah, you have to have money to buy a house. That, that's it. You have to have money, right? I have to explain that probably five, six, seven times a day. Yeah, you have to have money to buy a house. Um, you have to have your down payment, right? With FHA, it's three and a half percent. With conventional, if you haven't owned a home in the last three years, you could do 3%, uh, typically 5% on a conventional loan. That's a mis misunderstanding or uh, how you want to put it. But a lot of people think you have to have 20% down to do a conventional loan. Far from it. Uh, if you put down less than 20%, you'll have mortgage insurance, but you definitely don't need 20% to do a conventional loan. So uh, 3% minimum conventional, three and a half minimum FHA. Uh, I would encourage folks to have their down payment uh, in this market, not just in Nashville. Again, I lend in 30 some odd states, but in most markets, it's a seller's market, which means that house goes on the MLS. Uh, and within a week or so, they've got multiple offers. And you better believe one of those offers, if not most of them, are not going to be asking the seller to pay for their closing costs. So you have two things to contend with. You've got your down payment and then you've got your closing costs. And closing costs don't change by very much depending on the purchase price. All right, right. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time because I know Mondays are crazy. Mondays are always crazy, you know, in our business. So for people who wanna get in touch with you, um, how can they reach you? Uh, what's your number, your email, in which way you wanna want them to contact you? Yeah, by all means, uh, email or phone is great. Uh, cell phone, uh, and that's night's day, weekend, whenever. It's 214-490-4596 uh, or 214 -490 Yeah, 4596. <laughs> and then by email, it's Matt, M-A-T-T, at SouthLakeLoans.com. SouthLakeLoans with an S.
Okay, and I will make sure I put that, I'm gonna put all that information up on the video so that everybody can reach out to a knowledgeable loan officer. Can I say it again? Okay, I'm saying it again. A knowledgeable loan officer who can get you closed. Don't just have somebody who can write an application. This is the person who can get you all closed. This is my go-to. I endorse them 150%. And one, one thing, Rhonda, not to, not to keep you on there, prolong the video. I, I hear it, God knows how many times a day, well, I'm rate shopping. I'm rate shopping. Oh my God. It's insane, right? Most of the There's time no when you're- There's no such thing. There's no they, such thing. It doesn't exist. Here's it the point. It doesn't exist, say it. Now, most banks, if not all banks, are within an eighth of a point of one another. Yes. It's the equivalent of shopping for gasoline, mm -hmm. right? And you wouldn't drive four miles out of your way to save two cents on gas either. The reality of it is an eighth of a point in interest rate on say a $200,000 loan is a difference in payment of $12. Right. It means nothing if you don't close. And the thing about it is those banks that advertise rates that are a lot lower than everybody else. Number one, you have to read the fine print because they're charging points. points. But number, anybody who's undercutting the market means people aren't doing business with them under normal circumstances. Right. In this, you have to incentivize somebody with money to do business with you. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong there. And it's the places like Chase places like that where yeah you know if you close at all it's 60 plus days well guess what nobody's doing business with that unless you're incentivized to right. and they're doing the form of a slightly lower rate maybe an eighth maybe a quarter but again in the scheme of things it's a difference in payment of 12 15 20 bucks mm -hmm. if you're willing to risk your house and having a place to live or closing on time because that 12 bucks a month all goes to nothing if you have to spend an extra three weeks in a hotel, mm -hmm. uh, put your stuff in storage twice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, and it all falls back to what we opened with is the experience of the loan officer. If right. you're working with a loan officer over there who's been in the business for six months and they're fighting against that machine where they may be in one state, the underwriters in another state and the processors in another state, you know, and, and they're trying to figure out that system while they're working on your loan, while they don't have the experience even doing mortgages, I mean, that's, that's, it happens. And you can attest to this it happens more times than people yeah. think, Most you know, trying 12 bucks on a mortgage isn't the best way to shop for a mortgage. Personally, I, I would, and not to imply that we're not competitive, we're on the lower end of the spectrum. But I mean, you know, there's more important questions to ask a loan officer than what's your rate, because everybody's the same for the most part. And that $12 difference means nothing. But you know, the experience that you have probably should be the first question. Right. One more time, Matt, give them the number where they can contact you. I'm going to put it on the screen too, but give them the number one more time. Sure. I'm going to throw the off this line. Uh, it's 214 0137. And I think the cell is 214 490 4596. I'm almost positive. All right. That'll work. Thank you so much, Matt. I've been looking forward to doing this. So that way I don't seem like I'm just harping on the same old thing, but I want them to get. Uh, with a good loan officer who can get them closed and everything, everybody call him, you know, and but get your, do your homework first. Don't be calling him. Y'all know y'all ain't done y'all homework because y'all know how I am because that's why I'm, I'm protective. I'm just now letting y'all get to call him directly because so many of y'all hadn't done your homework, but do your homework first. Get your stuff together, then give Matt a call, okay? Credit income assets. Credit income assets. Yeah. That's it, guys. And get money in the bank. Put the money in the bank. They won't let you use the cash at the house. Just yeah. credit income assets, those three things. You can always call me or Rhonda for that matter. If you have any mortgage specific questions, we're always here to help. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. My pleasure, Rhonda. Good talking with you, as okay, always. You okay. Bye-bye.